Hi guys, um, so thank you for coming out this evening. Um, before we start, I wanted to say a few words. First of all, I would like to remind everyone that this university and this event are on the unceded territory of the Muslim people. So as we analyze the university and the world around us, it is important to acknowledge, um, acknowledge our place in the ongoing history of Canada as a colonial settler state. Um, the impact of colonialism continues to this day, so I ask that we all keep this in mind during the event. Um, as I hope you all know, this event is part of Retaking the University Conference, an, a conference organized by the Social Justice Center at UBC. Um, the purpose of this conference is to re reveal how systematic problems within the university structure relate to us and how we can make a difference. Um, in this event, um, we will have a lecture and question and answer period from Dr. Stephen Aldis, who will discuss the possibilities for building our capacity to resist within the existing neoliberal university. Dr. Stephen Aldis is a, po a poet, activist, and professor of contemporary literature at Simon Fraser University. His many books of poetry include The Commons, Talon Books 2008, on the material, Talon Books 2010, awarded the BC Book Prize of Poetry, and to the Barricades, Talon Books 2013. He has also written a novel, The Red Album, Book Thug 2013. His collection of essays on the Occupy movement, Dispatches from the Occupation, Talon Books, <laughs> Dispatches from the Occupation, Talon Books 2012, is a philosophical met meditation on activist tactics, social movements, and change. Currently, he is engaged in grassroots environmental justice work with Mining Justice Alliance and Rising Tide Vancouver, Coast Salish Territories. Um, so in this particular event, um, Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for coming tonight. And especially thank you to organizers for, for conceiving of this event and having this sort of event, and we obviously desperately need this, and we'll need more of it and more other things too. But this is an important component, just getting us together and talking. Uh, we'll get together and hopefully do other things as well, sometimes more physical and material, sometimes more mental. So we'll be a little bit mental tonight. Um, I, I, I'm, thank you so much for acknowledging the territory too. I, I think this is, especially where we are right now, pretty much straightforward and must be the biggest claim with it, but I always think that you know, some, even amongst the different groups here and what we now call Vancouver, there's some disagreement on whose was what uh, traditionally. So I'll also acknowledge the Slayer Tooth and, and, and Squamish peoples uh, because they probably uh, passed by numerous times at the very least, and of course, even married and those sorts of things. Uh, so I think I'm just going to dive right in. I, I've got a, a written talk because um, I'm, I'm more a writer than anything else, and I need to put words down on paper. And, and I admired Alain's ability to go through his cards. He, he, he didn't even seem to look at them, maybe you just turned them. <laughs> <laughs> you knew what was there already, you could go through his cards, really. But I'll, I'll read a prepared talk, and hopefully it won't be too uh, dense or academic at times. I'll just talk about um, silly images that are out there. Uh, we'll start with a very silly one, but I'm not going to say too much about that one. Okay. Yeah. It's the seagull disobeying the no seagull sign, which you might see floating around the internet. Um, is there one to do that from like specific one part is yeah. I don't know. Anyway, we'll see if I can still read them. I'm going to be no doubt idealistic and optimistic here today, to a to a certain extent, anyhow. This is a uh, strategic optimism. Because when we think about the university today, there's no end of pessimism, no end of dour, doom and gloom realism. The work we are needing to do together in the world resisting fossil fuel and other extractive projects, climate change and its consequences, resisting capitalism, which drives these processes, produces and profits from crises and injustice, and resisting the contemporary state and the various ideological state apparatuses, including the university, that have largely become tools for the interests of capital. All this requires a capacity for resistance that will depend upon a certain degree of optimism and even, dare I say, hope. So, 
allow yourself to be naive a bit and, and idealistic because we'll, we'll need that uh, fuel for our tanks. My remarks today will also be speculative and hypothetical. I'm not an expert on the university or its history. I'm an activist and an organizer, an anti-capitalist working with many others on the project of struggling for a more just society. I'm basing my comments on a fairly straightforward observation and question. The university is currently being used primarily to build the capacities of global capitalism. Uh, the discussion earlier about the new institute, I think that's exactly what you're seeing there. It's that the, the university being used um, under a smokescreen of justice or something else, you might want to call it, but really it's about building the capacities of capitalism to uh, operate better and more efficiently in the world. Could it alternatively be used to build our capacities to resist the same? That's the question. I'm going to have a sort of a half and half answer. Yes, maybe, but there's certain things we need to do. Mostly not. Here's the other things we need to do. This is in part to observe, as many have, that the university we thought we knew, or which we imagined, uh, is long gone. This university is nicely captured in some recent remarks by Noam Chomsky. Uh, this is a, a piece he wrote that just came out a few weeks ago on some various websites online. But one thing he says, uh, in sort of idealizing uh, what, what, that, that, that perfect university that we would like sometimes we wish existed. The goal of it is for the student to acquire the capacity to inquire, to create, to innovate, to challenge. That's education. As Chomsky details, that university has largely been replaced by the corporate neoliberal, neoliberal university, which privileges in very material ways through funding, hiring, um, they're called FTEs and SFU, I don't know if it's the same language here, but basically just you know, how they apportion faculty to students, sponsorship endowments, etc., etc. Uh, so in very material ways, uh, it privileges jobs and skills training tied to measure measurable economic outcomes. Thus the human potential of the university student is captured by colluding corporate and state structures and elites as a means of building the capacity of the market system. My understanding of this historical development, in a nutshell, goes something like this. There were essentially two largely confused, muddled, and overlapping universities in the post-war period. The nascent corporate university of the burgeoning military-industrial complex, which has led in Canada to the current, I call it this, resource-industrial complex, and the more utopian university of universal human rights and the democratic citizen. Both are reactions to post-war social and economic realities, and both played out in the explosion and spread of, state of the state-sponsored university system in the post-war years. I'm thinking about Canada and the US primarily. The corporate university was born of the realization that the new consumer market, increasingly based on technological innovation, was going to need a lot of highly skilled and brilliant innovators, as well as gainfully employed and upwardly mobile consumers. Thus, state support of the university had the general goal of economic growth and market competitive, competitiveness at its core, but in a loose sense, privileging support for the discovery of the new through broad and fairly open experimentation. Parallel to this, you've got this more utopian university, which we owe, I think in part, ironically, to fascism and the anti-fascist struggles of the 1930s and 40s. There were various and largely still uh, sorry, stillborn post-war efforts to re-establish democracy on a new and more solid footing, exemplified by documents like the 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights, which declares, for instance, the right to an education directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms." End quote. The idea that states needed to actively promote democratic ideas and ideology as a bulwark against fascism led to the active support of liberal education as productive of a great society, as uh, President Johnson in the 1960s the United States called it, uh, and the capacity for exercising democratic rights and responsibilities. The movements and conflicts of the 1960s tended to pit the latter university, the idealized democratic university, against the former, the military-industrial complex, as it was coming to be called. 
ironic, iconically captured in the contrast between an entity like Students for a Democratic Society on the one hand and the Vietnam War on the other. Thus making the university for a time a vital site of struggle and resistance. But through the neoliberal economic and social transformation beginning in the 1970s, the corporate university has come to dominate whittling away at the idea of the democratic university, and even honing the idea of potential market outcomes of university investment to the narrow field of measurable economic applications and, and direct job training. Okay, I want to turn to my real question here, which is one of resistance and the remaining potential, if any, for the university to build, enhance, and maintain, maintain the capacity to resist. The definition of resistance I'm using here, that resistance is more than any specific act of resistance, anything you might do specifically, it's more the fostering and maintenance of the capacity to resist. This comes from Howard Cagle, a very recent book that just came out in December, called On Resistance, which I, I highly recommend, I'll use a fair bit of it today. Resistance, Cagle argues, implies the tension of opposing forces, and, quote, to defy or take a stand assumes a capacity to resist, which is the outcome of previous stands within previous scenarios of opposed forces." End quote. Kegel is working actually from Karl von Clausewitz's classic On War, which he reads as a manual not of war but of resistance, in which resistance, people who are resisting, attempt primarily to build and maintain their capacity to resist, while aggressors attempt to erode resistance capacity. All this, quote, within a complex and dynamic spatio-temporal field that manifests itself in postures of dominance and defiance." End quote. In situations tending toward total domination, Kegel, uh, Kegel's example here is the renowned French resistance to fascist occupation in the Second World War, <clears throat> the struggle to maintain resistant capacity is even more desperate and more necessary. Longer quote. The recognition of a continuity between the everyday, unobtrusive formation of such a capacity, so the small acts we do that actually build our capacity to resist in the long term, and the more spectacular events of organized conscious resistance, so the march, the demonstration, the occupation, the things that seem a little more active and spectacular, is essential to understanding the survival of resistance under conditions of total domination. That is, under a condition of total domination, it's awfully hard to do the spectacular, big, noticeable move, but we can build capacity in smaller ways, perhaps a little more under the radar. Now, I'm not going to suggest that the, dominant, uh, the dominance of neoliberal ideology on the contemporary university campus is comparable to a Nazi occupation. It's not completely. <laughs> However, the relative absent, absence of noticeable resistance to this model present company excluded, I suppose, as well as the dearth of serious discussions about alternative models of a university education suggest a level of dominance that comes close to what Cagill is talking about here. And his point is that the capacity to build resistance, the fashioning of resistance subjectivities, as he calls them, is largely dependent upon everyday unobtrusive formations. I will come back to what these everyday <coughs> capacity building acts might consist of. Kegel also in invokes Jörg Lukács' uh, history and class consciousness to note that in the context of an historical tendency toward the reification of life and consciousness, the theory of resistance as capacity building is crucial to any attempt to defy that, that tendency. The building of the capacity to resist looks less to the possibility of changing consciousness than to identifying the sites, places, and moments where resistance to reification can emerge. So I'm really interested in that idea of the, the sites where the resistance can, can emerge and wondering if the university can still be such a site. These are moments of, inter, of, the, of invention where, uh, that explode in a culture dedicated to calculation, whether political invention in the, uses the example of workers, councils, or Soviets, or by leaps of artistic imagination beyond reification. So Kegel directs me to ask the question, isn't the university just such a site, characterized even under neoliberal pressures, the very pressures of reification he highlights, isn't it at the same time still a site of invention and artistic imagination beyond reification? And 
while there may uh, not be workers' councils or Soviets on campus, campus exactly, uh, there are structures of student and even faculty organization that, while often dormant, moribund, such as unused, have indeed at times been used for purposes of resisting unification. Early on, Cagle recall, uh, recalls the etymology of resistance in the Latin spare and the Greek stasis, which also names the occasion for the invention of democracy and what was uh, subsequently called politics, all in the notion of, of taking a stand and standing to get a political standing in a circle, let's say, and meeting and talking. Democracy and the political, the political generally implicates standing up with and against others, taking a stand, and the stasis of unresolved dialectical tensions. In part, what I'm suggesting is that resistance as an aspect of the practice of democracy is a key aspect of what the utopian university taught us and built our capacity for, critical thinking, empathetic analysis of difference and complexity, social organization and, and encounter, the planning and carrying out of social projects. However atrophy, the potential for building these capacities remains in the contemporary university, although it continues to be clipped, corralled, and directed towards the, those specific capacities that may build and maintain the market, rather than the democratic and resistant subject. I find it difficult to recommend anything other than a dual power sort of strategy. That is, calling for renewed efforts to build the capacity to resist the neo neoliberal university. I love that it. it's hard to say that word. I have a hard time saying neoliberal. My mouth doesn't want to make the word. Uh, within the current university, while at the same time pursuing alternative and prefigurative educational possibilities, mostly outside the university. I will take these simultaneous movements in order looking first at some recent activities at SFU and the example of the 2012 Quebec student strike, to examine the possibilities for building resistant uh, capacity within and against the current university, then turning to the example of free and alternative institutions which might build our capacity to resist outside the university. All right. What happens, what is actually accomplished when you bring radical content into the conservative structure of the university. That's the, the first thing I asked myself. So recently at SFU, um, I hosted an event with uh, representatives of the Mi'kmaq Warrior Society who were on a speaking tour. There was an event at Capilano as well. But was there an event here at UBC? You know, it might have been. No, maybe not. Uh, so it was simple enough for me to, through the Institute of the Humanities at SFU, to book a room and advertise this event and have these folks come in. Lots of people showed up. Actually, had two events at SFU, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. There was probably 40 people in the afternoon event and more than 200 in the evening. Came out to hear these people speak. Now, these are um, about as radical an activist as we can imagine in Canada right now. So these are people who are uh, in a direct struggle with the state via the RCMP. They're lighting RCMP cars on fire. They're being beaten and arrested. Uh, the fellow on the, your right there spent about six weeks in jail without being able to make a phone call, without uh, contacting a lawyer, with nothing. Solitary confinement for, for six weeks with no um, charter rights being observed whatsoever in Canada. Uh, and the, the, the woman on the other side here was, was quite violently beaten and arrested. She got out a little quicker than the other fellow. Uh, so th I think. The fact that maybe 250 people at SFU came out to hear these speakers, uh, it was a very inspiring talk. They mainly just described what they've been through, why they were doing it, how they were going to continue doing this. Um, as far as the university is concerned, it, it could have been an event about anything. The university doesn't care at all. It's just, here's a box you want to put something in, you want to use our system to advertise it, spread the word, they don't care. So an event like this might have interesting impact on a community outside the university and overlapping with the university, but it does nothing to resist the neoliberal structure of the university itself. It could care less. Just another customer. Another example would be that uh, just a few weekends ago, I hosted a, a, a direct action training session, again at SFU, using existing loopholes where I can get a free space and uh, those uh, wonderful young activists, um, Sean Devlin and Brigitte Dupap with uh, Shit Harper Gate, uh, put on this training session. Uh, the, the staff 
who'll show up at the event to make sure you've got water and anything you need. They're sort of standing in the back while this starts, and they did not want to make it this. Right? They sort of shuffled out of the room pretty quickly and didn't come back. <laughs> Nevertheless, again, this is something that's uh, uh, capacity building for social movements outside, overlapping, around the university, does nothing to change what the university is at all, I don't think. All right. So the university here might be a platform or site used for organizational, even educational purposes that reach beyond its mandate. However, the real for, uh, focus in these instances, and I'm not knocking this, is a good thing, is on external struggles. The university as a structure remains untouched and unresisted. Uh, this is a quotation from Andrea Creamer, who was a, I wasn't, I'm not sure, I think she's still around the city. She was a graduate student in uh, arts, I guess, at least. She was a student in the Gold Corp Center for the Arts. Uh, she says, she talks about something she calls spatial justice, uh, which she interprets or defines as the simple right to be in the common space is as important as the education being given to the bums and seats at the university. And so clearly, the, the neoliberal <coughs> university denies this spatial justice. It doesn't look at it as a space that, that needs to be, that it could be affected by in any way. The other example I wanted to look at pretty quickly was the resistance against uh, the Gold Corp donation in 2010. These are fairly blurry, and that might be a good idea because some people might not want their faces um, identified by these. So, you know, a bit of this came up earlier, but after Gold Corp um, donated, the $10 million to SFU's uh, art school. And it's really important to remember how this happened. You know, the, the school was brand new. It was mid-September. They had a special event to announce it for its grand opening. And the president stood up and said, and by the way, uh, Gold Corp has given us $10 million, and this is now going to be known as the Gold Corp Center of the Arts. No student knew about this event in advance. No professor knew about that. No one knew a thing about this. So everyone was in complete shock. Did not know what to make of this at all. Um, we started digging and trying to find out where, where was this decision made, who, if anyone, was consulted. And again, purely it's university advancement, a very small group who, who fundraised for the university. They, and, and in consult, consultation with the president and only the highest members of the administration, were the only people in any way that had any contact with this decision to, to take this money. So a group of students called uh, Students Against Gold Corp and Gentrification uh, organized around the issue. Uh, I, I was the only faculty member that was consistently involved. We built a website, we made leaflets, we held events to hand out and, uh, and uh, pamphlet the campus and let everyone know what was going on. Um, I mentioned earlier we received uh, a letter from Gold Corp's lawyers threatening a lawsuit, a, a, a libel suit, if we didn't take down the website. We, and, you know, we did consult the lawyer and the lawyer said, oh yeah, you're libeling. Because <laughs> we called them a criminal corporation. You can't use the word criminal uh, unless you've got it unless they had actually been charged and convicted of something, then you could call them a criminal. You couldn't refer to them as a criminal corporation. Uh, and numerous other things we'd said. Um, never, so that, that could kind of chill on some of the efforts, but nevertheless, this is after uh, that uh, letter, that slap suit threat letter was received. And a very large rally was organized in downtown. The university's board of governors were meeting in a building downtown. We marched the building, we occupied it. We shut down, and they couldn't continue the board of governors meeting. We shut it down, uh, forced the president to come out and talk to us. Um, I read a poem into a bullhorn. It's a little hard to see. I, I printed this little pamphlet of, of anti gold court poems. And at this reading, actually, a lawyer came up and asked for a copy, which I happily gave him one. And I never heard back from him, so who knows where that got him. Um, you know, a, a small group of faculty members actually managed to have several meetings with the president and pushed a little bit and we, we got, and he was very sympathetic, so we acted. Uh, and they did change the policy at SFU and like this. So there's now a policy in place that any donation over a million dollars has to be presented to the, the Senate for discussion before it can be approved, uh, which is not what happened in the Gold Corp situation. And there's some loose language that they, we pushed hard, they wouldn't go for any language we wanted, but they put some loose language in around ethics and, and the, the kind of companies that the university would associate its brand with that would be scrutinized carefully or something, but nothing really as specific as what we really wanted. The other example I was really quickly about is the, the TSSU strike last year at SFE with the Teaching and Support Staff Union. Um, had been two years without a contract. 
uh, have been starting some uh, low-level strike activities, like having a wildcat like once a week or something like that. A variety of events they were doing. They weren't really getting anywhere with the university at all. So a large event was organized. We probably had 250 students out, which these days organizing at a university in Western Canada is a sizable number. It was enough that using these chains we're holding, which all have little cards on them signed by students saying they support the union, we managed to surround the administration building of the university and close it off with this chain. Uh, the, they had locked down the building. There were three or four security guards at every door on the inside. But one of the grad students found uh, uh, at the loading bay there was only one security guard. So about eight or nine of us went down there and pushed our way in. I grabbed a guy that had a drum and brought him inside. So we got inside the administration building, we marched up and down, beating his drum and chanting as loud as we could. Because the, the timing was, again, that the uh, university administration were meeting to s supposedly discuss uh, contractual stuff. Which it, you know, they're probably discussing how much longer they delay doing anything. Uh, we came down to the building and opened the front door so all the 200 people could come inside too. Uh, so we helped the front, so it's great. So myself on the chair of, of history, uh, was Mark Lear, who's a great um, labor historian. We helped the front doors of the, of the administration building open while the students came in. We dumped all these, the, we forced the administration to come down, so this is the, the legs they can't see. On the right of the shadow uh, is the VP academic, and this is VP of legal affairs in the middle. Uh, came down and we dumped all the cards at their feet. And we probably spent 20 minutes, 200 people chanting as loud as we could in their faces. Then we had a brief impromptu meeting with them, and two days later the contract was done. We signed a contract after two years of delay. So that was kind of an effective action, that it pushed them to actually do something, to pony up. Apparently the VP academic came to the president of the faculty association and, go, and said, well, you've done it now. You know, your professors are all writing letters and getting angry, and, and you, know, you guys are going to have to live with the consequences, because it's going to impact professors. <laughs> Meaning, you know, they're going to cut something somewhere, right? Okay. Now let's look quickly at the, well, let's look at the Quebec student strike in 2012. There are two lessons from the Quebec student strike that I want to focus on. First, that their efforts were anchored in an analysis of broad social issues that were as relevant outside the university as they were inside of it. And second, the degree to which the students' capacity to resist was dependent upon structures and practices long in place in Quebec universities. So they weren't, as we unfortunately are here in the West, starting from scratch, going, I'm upset about something, how can we organize that? Uh, they have a culture around this. Same in Chile. Yeah, well, in lots of parts of the world, exactly. Chile's been amazing the last few years. In fact, two student activists are now members of parliament and legislature, whatever it's called in Chile. Yeah. Uh, Quebec's liberal government def uh, definitely saw the confrontation over tuition fees in light of, a, of the wider market and its neoliberal policies. Arguing that Quebec's global competitiveness, they said, required increased funding through a tuition, tuition hike. Ingar Solti, whose uh, analysis I am following here, he's a, a grad student at uh, York University, has written extensively on the Quebec student movement. Uh, further notes that the government's actual aim was to shift the costs of the economic crisis onto the students. I'll quote um, Solti at length here. Students saw a long-term neoliberal agenda at work in the tuition increase. This agenda's aim is the lasting transformation of education into a commodified service and the reorientation of the universities and colleges toward the interests of the private capitalist economy. However, these students argue that education is a social right and that democracy requires free access to education. They counterposed a uh, humanistic education to a commercialized one. In doing so, the students could point out that Canada had ratified the 1976 United Nations International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Culture Rights, in which the right to uh, tuition-free education is uh, enshrined. Um, so it, basically, almost every country on this planet signed that in 1976. The United States didn't. A couple other countries did, but the vast majority of countries signed this charter, which says you know, university education should be free, ideally, or as close to free as it can be made, or something like that says. Um, you know, these kind of charters, countries sometimes sign them and then quickly ignore them, don't they? Nevertheless. Okay, despite the media's attempt to portray students as spoiled minors, but Quebec already has the lowest tuition costs in Canada. I'm hearing that over and over again. 
the student strikers consistently identified their struggle with broader questions of indebtedness and precarization, and the conflict between austerity and issues of human rights and dignity. As class, one of the key um, student unions spokesperson, uh, Gabriel Nadeau Dubois, put it, students were resisting not only the specific measures, but the vision of society and state embodied in the liberal, uh, liberals' policies and budget. So it's, it's, it's more than uh, uh, simply about tuition. It's about the complete sense of what a society is and what part education plays in a society. In part, this strategy was enacted through consistency and of messaging, embodied in the work of official student union spokespeople like Nadeau Dubois, who just published a book uh, on his experience. It was just published in the last few weeks. Uh, and this, uh, uh, in, in, in French, in Quebec, and there'll be an English translation coming in the next year ahead sometime. And significant effort, efforts of solidarity building through outreach. Solti, again, I'm going to quote here, uh, summarizes, the students formed strike committees, held general assemblies, organized alternative education events, and built alliances with organizations and social movements outside of the post-secondary institutions. By the middle of March 2012, out of an entire student body of 400,000 in Quebec, 300,000 were on strike. Altogether, 125 organizations, trade unions from the healthcare and education sectors, municipal policy campaigns, anti-poverty initiatives, and environmental organizations affiliated with the Left Hand Coalition. The Left Hand Coalition is the name for sort of a broad student movement writ large. Clearly, these efforts depended upon pre-existing organizational capacities. As Cagill noted, any successful struggle will be, this was Cagill again, the outcome of previous stands within previous scenarios of opposed forces. That's exactly what we had in Quebec. Um, and this is the second point about the Quebec student strike. The precedent and practice of radical student resistance was already well established in the province, with there having been no less than nine student strikes since the late 1960s, when nominal tuition was first introduced in the province. Not only does the, this make the possibility of a strike part of any given student's sense of what their university experience might entail, so you go in the university knowing, well, the striking is one thing that you do when you're a student, perhaps. It's a potentiality there, anyway. It instills the knowledge that solidarity and collective struggle are worthwhile, because they've been successful as a tracker. This is crucial capacity building. Just as significantly, it is also predicated upon there being structures in place within the university to facilitate student resistance. Those 300,000 students who wound up on strike and in the streets in Quebec were organized for the most part into radical student unions with a grassroots structure. Students belong to departmental committees. So if you're a member of CLAPS, the, one of the larger more active student unions, you went to a meeting in your department, if you're in geology, if you're in English or history, that's where you went and organized as a member of class from, from the department up. Uh, so it's kind of like the, the, the Soviet kind of structure that Cagill references. It was at the departmental level where students met, held assemblies, made decisions, and took votes. Representatives from departments would then, in a spokes council like structure, move up to the scale of the university. Uh, attend general campus assemblies where they could only represent the will of their individual department student bodies. So your representative couldn't go up the line to the, to the union meeting on the whole campus and, and uh, go against what uh, the individual department had voted on. Most of this I'm getting from Nado Dubois. In BC, clearly what we lack is the capacity to build by, uh, sorry, what we lack is that the capacity built by practice of student radicalism and organization from the grassroots of individual departments on up. The structures are there. We have, at least at SFU we do, student unions organized by department. But there is no culture of actually organizing resistance through these structures. So I know in the English Student Union, there are about three people that actually, out of 600 English majors, about three show up to English Student Union meetings. Um, and they've got budget, the money they can spend, they could put on events, they could try to put on some events. But for the most part, there's, there's simply there's no culture that through your, and every student is in the student union, essentially, right? But there's no culture of going to your department and using that as a basis for organizing uh, anything on campus, more or less. Okay. Uh, 
If students want to start organizing along the lines the Quebec model suggests, they would need to do so now, Marie. Because it will take a considerable time to build the culture and capacity to resist through the student union structure, if we're going to go that way. But in the absence of this culture and capacity, students also need to solve the problem of continuity, of handing on the culture of resistance to the next generation of students, so that the practice becomes, as appears to be the case in Quebec, part and parcel of student life. So, Nadeau Dubois describes, you know, you, when you start a university and there's like clubs setting up and people handing out leaflets and hey, maybe you want this, maybe that, the unions are front and center right there telling new students about how you organize on campus. This is what you do. These are the issues you should be concerned about. These are the avenues for pursuing those, uh, those issues, and we can teach you how to do it. All right. Where am I? This is where I am. <laughs> okay. The moment of reactive resistance is volatile and vulnerable, and needs in some way to metamorphose into an affirmative, inventive resistance that does not just react to the intolerable predicament, but transforms itself and its condition through the work of resistance, the actualizing of, the, of its capacity to resist. Within the university, we resist its neoliberal term, I hope. But as Cagle here suggests, we need an inventive resistance too, something to be for, not just against. We might be for free tuition, for instance, and base this, as the Quebec students did, in the language of universal human rights, referencing the 1948 UN Declaration of the 1976 um, Covenant I mentioned before. But it's not entirely clear to me that the state and its institutions, including the university, will be entirely amenable to this demand. Requisite, yeah, add your own irony here if you like. At least, we need to build considerable capacity around this issue, and this capacity will need to at least in part be built outside the current university structures, where, as I've suggested above, so often, uh, sorry, which, as I've suggested above, so often frustrate our attempts to mold the university to our, as opposed to the market's, capacities. Another way of putting this, we might yet wrest the state away from the interests of capital, and, this return, and thus return to a renewed sense of the publicness of education, and republicanness, maybe we'll go with Elaine's definition earlier too. Uh, but this is doubtful. The state which could fund substantial public educational projects is also a state historically built by escalating capitalist economies and models of unlimited growth. The contemporary state directs the majority of human capacities back towards the market because the state is of and for the market. What we need is an educational commons, and this can only really be found outside the existing university. So returning to my previous idea of a dual power struggle, if we find that we need to organize for free tuition, for instance, we might also need a free university to build our capacities for that struggle, for future broader struggles, and to provide in the present what the neoliberal university currently denies and frustrates. There are a number of models and examples of free universities. I'm jumping ahead of myself on my slides, but anyway, I hope you're not here. Um, I recommend looking closely at the EduFactory website, if you've never heard of that or seen it before, Ed EduFactory. Um, this is a model of a floating or virtual university. EduFactory describes their project as a global autonomous university. We do not want to enter the educational market. On the contrary, our aim is to open a process of conflict in the knowledge production system and its mechanisms of hierarchization. I also recommend looking at the Brisbane Free University, which holds its classes in a parking lot underneath a bank in Brisbane, Australia. Brisbane Free University's website describes the project this way. We believe that education should be a commons. Brisbane Free University therefore opens an autonomous space in which the empowering processes of teaching and learning belong to everybody. We believe that a more just world is possible and that this is one way of bringing it into being. We want to reimagine education by bringing conversation and critical thought into the heart of the city. We want to challenge the divide between the academic sphere and the public forum, between the sandstone and the street corner, and remember the sheer, simple joy of learning for its own sake, 
the Brisbane Free, Free University grew out of the Occupy movement in Brisbane, and, and it, it really figures itself as occupying open air public space and conducting things like seminars and workshops and lecture series for free in that space. Now I'm catching up. Right? Finally, there's the model of the Zapatistas Escuelita, or a little school. In the summer of 2013, the Zapatistas of Chiapas, Mexico, opened their communities to teach outsiders what it really means to be a Zapatista today. Their day-to-day -day life and acts of resistance and their struggle in maintaining autonomy. This is experiential learning at its radical best. And I use the term experiential learning. Ironically, that's a, a term that SFU's administration has been pushing all the time. Really, in their mind, that's a, that's a market thing. Experiential learning means you know, learning on the job and being in the market. Uh, this is something else, a different experience. Participants were immersed in the daily life of the indigenous rebels. The little, little school consisted of living, eating, and working in the fields with the Zapatistas, as well as more formal teachings of the history and structure of their autonomous government. In the end, what many of the students learned was that being an autonomous indigenous community involves a lot of hard work, per per perseverance, and a strong communal structure, what one of the uh, organizers there calls controlled freedom. Very, very organized. The idea of a free university reminds us that the university is not an end, but a means to an end. The real goal of our resistance and struggles is not a better and more just university, but a better and more just society and world. The free university is a prefigurative university which embodies in its modes, structures, and practices the ideals of its utopian goal. I would like to conclude my comments today with something of a proposal for a free university based on the Melbourne and Zapatista, uh, sorry, it's Brisbane, I changed that to Melbourne, okay. The Brisbane and Zapatista examples. A proposal for a school of resistance, which I don't know, that, that's, not, that's just a placeholder if this ever became a reality. Uh, and I was really inspired by the Jack Black movie, School of Rock. <laughs> School of Resistance is the best I can do for now. Uh, which would both prefigure the uni free university education we would like to see, at the same time as it builds our capacity to resist the neoliberalization neo of the existing university. Jerry Zasloff, a retired SFU professor, writes, I think turning to self-organizing within, between, and beyond the university with a nod to our abilities to perform visibility while, mani while manipulating what exactly gets seen is one of the ways to articulate what should be done. A school of resistance would take up the space of the within, between, and beyond, drawing faculty and students from the existing universities and beyond, and feeding its capacities back into the struggle to resist the neoliberal university, as well as the wider struggle against neoliberal capitalism of which the university is itself a part. What if an education looked like a social movement? The Brisbane and Zapatista examples suggest such a, uh, a comparison. What if the point of an education was assembling and building the capacities to create social change, ensure a dignified life, and a just world? What if the point was solidarity and building our capacity to serve and support each other? A school organized like a social movement would, by definition, structure, and function, be better able to resist the neoliberal agenda broadly because it will be designed just for this purpose. Looking towards the existing university, from which many of the participants would inevitably be drawn, such a school could also help provide continuity for student organization, making this a key aspect of this capacity building agenda, helping to ensure that activism is a natural and necessary part of student life. So I'm suggesting a kind of porosity, where you're organizing essentially outside the university, but many of you overlap at the university, and, and it becomes a place to maintain the kind of um, knowledge around capacity building structures that simply isn't there in universities in this part of the world right now. So where can we house that right now, when, when it's not being built in the actual university? Maybe we can build a, a, a free, autonomous institution that in part has that um, uh, goal in mind to, to build capacity both inside and outside the university. Thus, a school of resistance would have as one of its key functions the maintenance of the capacity to resist the neoliberal university, in relation to which it would function as a sort of educational French resistance. The curriculum of a, uh, for a school of resistance would be established by its General Assembly of Participants, 
who would also be its potential facilitators, so no structural distinction between instructors and students. Embodying the fact that there are necessary spaces of contestation and resistance exist both within and without the university, the, uh, the following model of act, um, and following the model of activist training camps, this curriculum could include, and I probably think I should skip over the players, throwing all these ideas down earlier, but it's part of it. Um, it's maybe not something we can go to any, any detail right now, but just some, some topics that we might want to organize uh, the generation of uh, knowledge around, uh, we might want to be more informed about. And at the same time, uh, what if a university education provided training similar to the way the social movements do? So if you've ever been to a, to a, like a, a Greenpeace camp or any, any, any of the, a lot of the NGOs have put on these kind of activist training camps, and you get these intellectual components where they explain to you what's going on in the world in terms of capitalism and climate change and fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they also give you hands-on training. Here's actual things you can do with your body about that problem. So what if a university actually did that? And therefore built our capacity to resist the state rather than simply feed back into the market. So there might be all sorts of uh, kinds of training that we would want to be that we want to offer, including building uh, radical student capacity, how to organize on the campus, how to use your unions to better effect, for instance. A school of resistance would have to find rel uh, relatively independent free spaces in which to meet and hold events. In a city like Vancouver, this is one of the biggest challenges. It's just so expensive. The occasional use of university facilities would not be out of character and possibly, probably unavoidable. But the purpose of a school resistance would be to both provide the free radical movement and campaign specific education that the neoliberal university is so often not providing, while at the same time seeking to resist and build the capacity to transform that neoliberal university. In this regard, a school of resistance might find allies and some support in existing nodes of radical pedagogy within the existing university. The examples I'm familiar with at SFU is that there is something called the Institute of Humanities that you can go to with a very radical agenda and they can get you free rooms. Which you know, just as if I go to the university as, as a professor and say, can I book a room outside my class time to hold an event in? They'll go, sure, it's $300. I can't do it. Um, but if I go through the uh, SF Perg, if I go through the Institute of Humanities, if I go through uh, the um, uh, Van City Office for Community Engagement at the Woodward's building inside the Gold Corp Center, I can get a free room. Now, I only do things inside the Gold Corp Center that directly address extraction. And, and Gold Corp is always on the table, whatever I would be involved with, in the Gold Corp Center. I'm not going to go there for a, um, to, to organize a dance for a second. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you can use those. I think you have to. But it would also draw upon the energies and expertise of university students and faculty. So it's, it's impossible for it not to be overlapped. Finally, a school of resistance would move outward into, onto the active ground of social struggles as much as it would move inward on university. A school of resistance could provide militant research to various activist struggles and join in organizational coalitions or act in solidarity to, specific, uh, to support specific struggles, campaigns, and actions. It could also organize its own projects and actions, seeking support and solidarity from the many grassroots organizations and movements it might partner with. Thus, a school of resistance would function as its own grassroots organized organization and affinity group, shifting fluidly from pedagogy to direct action, from the field of knowledge production to the field of movement organization and active struggle. Okay, let me end with this. This is for my, a student group in Quebec that produced a poetry journal. Uh, again, Gabriel Nadeau de Bois told me about this. He started talking about poetry. He said, oh, you've seen his website. I looked at it, and it's, there's like literally hundreds, if not thousands, of poems that were written by students during the months of the Quebec student strike and put in on this, in this online journal. I thought, okay, well, I've seen that before. It's always kind of curious that people who are active in some kind of social struggle, think, oh, what we need is a bunch of poetry on a website somewhere. Well, even as a poet, I always find that curious. Uh, but there's more than that. There's photographs on the website where this comes from of the editors and participants in the, in the production of the student literature journal marching and demonstrating 
and, and uh, under their sign of their own flag, with the name of a journal on it, and handing out their issues of the journal in the midst of a march with all the other students. So they didn't just edit and print a journal, they didn't just write poems, hold readings, they organized together as an affinity group active within the wider movement. They marched under their banner in the mass dem uh, street demonstrations of 2012, handing poetry leaflets out as they moved through the streets. For my embodies the sort of dual power I think we need to foster. Because it's just this sort of determination to struggle everywhere in the fields of the intellect and the fields of active resistance that builds our capacity to resist through the persi uh, persistence and pervasiveness of our resistance. Okay. I mean, I'll end with one very short poem. A friend of mine, who I don't think is here, uh, comes, I, I said, I'm not going to read poems. You better read a poem. <laughs> this is a very short one. It's called Into the Frame. Seems like fewer off the top inside of us, or against half of us, gun, pedal, archery, no longer to arch, but to practice. What representation is, is a winter of spent enclosures. I give it spatial egress. There's all of us. Now grow. Thank you.
So I didn't mean to for it to sound way off, because the, the students had struggled forever with this. They organized that event. Um, I think the, the event was, was um, powerful in that it did create a broader collision than it had existed. So I, I think there were probably 30 faculty members at that rally amongst 250 people or so. So I think it's good that faculty showed up and participated. Um, I think it's good that faculty who are more protected than students, right? Because it's got to go back to the tenure question, that sort of thing. That it's good that, that we're the ones that help, you know, push security guards aside and hold open doors and like that. But I don't mean to think, suggest that we were the reason um, it changed. Uh, we, we played a little role, and, and I think that, that needs to happen. And I, I'm excited because it never does. You know, the, 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 as equally as there's a problem of not enough student organization activism, it's even worse for faculty, where you're less likely to do anything. Uh, and that's, that, I've been noticing that culture change a little bit in the last few years. So we, we, we wrote a letter in support of the, of the TSSU strike, demanding the university to re resolve it. And we got 200 faculty members out of 890 or whatever there are signed on to a letter. Um, that's, in the SFU's experience, that's not enough. They just don't do that. So, that, that, that played a, a small role in, 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 in shifting things a bit. But I, the, the students have been working on this forever, and they're, they're, they're the ones that organized that rally, invited professors to come. They're the ones that, that got all those people out and, and had the idea and the plan to, to surround the building. Everything that went on there, it's students, it's students who came along and said, we're going to go in the back door if you want to come and drag me with them. Uh, it was all student generated. So, uh, yeah, point taken, I don't want to misrepresent it too badly there. Did you have another? I think you said you had a couple of well, I was just waiting for oh. people to say things. Mm -hmm. I mean? Especially in a place like here where there's a vacuum, we don't, we don't know necessarily. 
no one's here to teach us how to organize the students, let's say. We're going to have to be virtually outside the university and doing that together anyhow. Because it's just the structure's not there for us. But there's an empty shell <laughs> that we could occupy in some way, perhaps. Uh, but it's a, it's a big uphill struggle against that thing. Um, thank you. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Also, um, you were talking about how the student strike was so much more than just the tuition itself. Uh, just to talk about, um, you talked about Gary and then as well. Uh, in one of his speeches, he says, like, 300,000 people don't want strike because of $1,625. Like, that doesn't make sense. It's not about that. It's about so much more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that, that definitely talks about that. As well as, I'd like to point out, the inherent disconnect between society and what was happening in the universities through how the media simply couldn't understand and how the organization at thoughts worked on the direct democracy and how they couldn't accept that somebody couldn't make decisions for other people and had to consult them before saying so. So there's a lot of problems with the, the spokespersons not being able to condemn violence and answering simply like, we can't, we don't have a mandate from our members to do so. Mm -hmm. We would have to first consult them, vote on it, and then express our position. And nobody, like, essentially nobody in society understood that or accepted that as, as a viable answer. Yeah. The, the consistency is what amazes me there. They, they, they were consistent about it. They, they stuck to that uh, um, structure, that process, and they, and they were consistent in their messaging. And this is, you know, it's hard not to draw some comparisons with Occupy. And certainly, the, when I met Nathan Dubois was when he came up here. Um, so, maybe late in 2012, I would think. I don't remember when. But the, the group he spoke to, the, the meeting I was at, I think, were largely people that were involved in Occupy Vancouver. Uh, and he was sort of at pains at times to draw distinctions uh, about the meaning and processes of demo direct democracy. Because the accountability model is important and shared, perhaps. But you know, you can't say, well, we do vote them, right? <laughs> when, you're at, when you're in that smaller room with, with your, um, uh, uh, your, your union um, group at the departmental level, there's a vote, and the majority care. It's, it's once you move up the line, you're, you're, you're beholden to, that, to the grassroots where the vote was taken. Uh, so you know, that's, they had structures and, and they had um, practices they learned that actually bypass and dealt with a lot of the things that just took the knees out of Occupy, which is endless discussion and the ability of one or two people who might have been cops in disguise there to, to cause a problem anyway, or just weren't stable people, who, who railroaded and made a mess of the whole of, of, of the media at a, at a given moment. And then they have process in place to, to, to deal with that, that kind of situation. So those were really kind of interesting um, things that activists can learn from the particular way that that, that work is structured. It takes me back to that, that um, um, term that comes out of the, the Zapatistas, of, um, at least from the, from the, the little school last, last summer, um, if I can find it again, uh, of talking about controlled freedom. Right? So there is a structure that's enabling uh, the freedom, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. And again, this stuff has been developed over time. Despite that, I think mean, it's totally right. When you, once you get out there and actually start making a social movement, it's, it's happening. You're in the street, day by day, the cops are there. Uh, it's, it's in the media, there's cameras in your face. They learn so much uh, simply by, by being outside the school and in that movement. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Well, just another specific thing. It yeah. struck me when Gabriel Nadeau was here that a hell of a lot of organizing, at least in British Columbia, is email and Facebook. Yeah. And somebody thinks they're an organizer because they shoot something out of an email. And he was at pains to talk about the importance of face-to-face -face talk, face-to-face -face organizing, yeah. spending time on a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah. And that the, uh, the Twitter or the Facebook came after all of that for very specific things. So, Organizationally, I thought that was a really important kind of direction, which I don't think most activists understand out here, frankly. Yeah, I think, well, 
it depends, but uh, the groups that I, I work with, it's, it's very important to meet face to face as regularly as often uh, as, as they can. Um, I, I can't keep up, for instance, with a group like, like Rising Tide, who will have three or four or five or six meetings a week. <laughs> um, they, there's, they're constantly face to face. And because the things they're doing are of a nature that, that it wouldn't be secure to do them outside of a face to face meeting, uh, even then, we're, we're talking in code. But yeah, I, I, you know, I agree with that too. And again, this is problems you've seen in, in activism this, in this part of the world, for sure in recent years, is a lot of the problems happen online. That's where they play out and happen. You know, that's where they evolve and snowball. Uh, it's because people aren't meeting face to face. Part of the you know. So I suspect where we part ways somewhat is on the concept of resistance. Mm -hmm. And what resistance is about, and where it leads to. Mm -hmm. uh, your initial quotes talked about resistance to build capacity for resistance. Mm -hmm. And, um, but none of the examples, you, you talked about social justice at one point as being an outcome of resistance. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing larger, there was no vision, at least as expressed today, uh, within which resistance took place. Now I can understand that, given how fragmented everything is now, that any form of resistance is a step forward. But we're seeing many examples of resistance in, say, uh, Egypt, Turkey, you know, Syria. Um, where resistance without some sort of vision, political direction, and real solid organization.